Media coverage of the MH17 crash in eastern Ukraine in 2014 led to a battle between Russian and Western media outlets. The lack of credible facts hasn't prevented many in the West from jumping to conclusions. A Buke missile widely believed to have been fired by pro-Russian rebels. Common sense says the Ukrainians did it. Russia Today presented the Russian perspective of events. The channel is financed by the Russian government and broadcasts 24 hours a day, seven days a week, in English, Spanish, Arabic, and as of late, in German as well. Hallo und herzlich willkommen zu unserer aller, aller, aller ersten Sendung. The channel's coverage often stirs controversy. Russia Today Network has deployed uh, to promote President Putin's fantasy about what is playing out on the ground. It's a great privilege as a journalist to be working for an organization that John Kerry calls a propaganda bullhorn. MH17 was the last in a very long line of incidents with RT. Um, it, was, it was just the, the final point and I snapped. The world according to Russia today. Is that just the news from a Russian perspective? Or Kremlin propaganda? And that is why personally I cannot be part of network funded by the Russian government. That We willen de onderste steen boven krijgen. En als duidelijk wordt dat dit een aanslag was, dan zal ik er mij persoonlijk voor inzetten dat de daders worden opgespoord en hun gerechte straf krijgen. While the Netherlands lead a criminal investigation into the disaster, media worldwide speculate on how the plane may have crashed, Russia Today included. The channel presents various theories on what may have happened. And we will start with breaking news. Another jet was detected at the same time and place of the Malaysian plane crash in eastern Ukraine and had the characteristics of a military aircraft. That is what Russia's defence ministry revealed less than an hour ago. Russia's Interfax news agency is quoting a source in the Russian aviation industry claiming President Putin's plane may have actually been the target of the attack. It is claimed that the president's jet crossed paths over Warsaw at the exact same height as the doomed Boeing. Now, just 40 minutes later. Most likely, and I'm not an expert here, or I'm going to wait for the investigation, but it seems to me common sense says the Ukrainians did it. It seemed to us that the Russian media were very quickly making sure that there were alternative theories for how this plane had been destroyed other than the one that was very quickly coming out of Western capitals, out of London and out of Washington and uh, out of Australia too, that uh, the plane had been shot down by a book missile launcher controlled by the, by the rebels. It's a tragic and devastating scene. People's clothes and belongings and their life jackets are scattered amongst the charred bodies. You can still smell the death and the burning in the air. But it's going to be... BBC correspondent Daniel Sandford is one of the first journalists at the crash site. He is astonished by the Russian coverage. What would you normally expect, which is a sort of coming together of a theory about what might have happened. In fact, what you were getting was multiple alternative theories. Well, uh, there might have been a Ukrainian uh, jet hiding behind the airliner. It might have been a Ukrainian jet that shot down the airliner. Uh, they, they might have been trying to, uh, the Ukrainians might have been trying to shoot Putin's plane, but actually they shot a civilian plane instead. Former head of the BBC World Service, Richard Sambrook, reviews the footage aired by Russia Today just hours after the crash. Incredible. Let's see, can we uh, hear from another person who uh, was near the scene on the Russian-Ukraine border when this uh, plane came down? According to preliminary, preliminary information coming from militias, the... The aircraft was brought down by a missile, presumably coming from the positions of the Ukrainian military. This information will be verified. It could be that the uh, aircraft was shut down by Ukrainian air defenses. I saw Malaysian passports myself just now. Here you have what, what pretends to be a, a, an eyewitness. There's no sense of who this individual is. Is it a Russia Today journalist? They're not introduced as that. They're introduced as simply somebody on the ground. And it mixes eyewitness um, uh, e evidence of seeing the 
wreckage and the bodies and the passports and suddenly inserts this line that um, uh, you know, military reports say it must have come from the Ukrainian army. All the shooting down of planes that had happened that far had been Ukrainian planes being shot down by the rebels. So anything like that that had come to me, my immediate question would be, well, I didn't even realize the Ukrainians were in the business of uh, using air defenses at the moment. Uh, so yeah, that, um, I wouldn't have aired that, put it that way, without a lot of checking. When you see a report that mixes um, unsupported assertions in the middle of uh, factual reporting, uh, then it just increases that suspicion that it's a deliberate misinformation. Afshin Ratansi is a British presenter at RT UK, Russia Today's dedicated UK channel. He is the only Russia Today employee willing to talk to us. Headquarters in Moscow have denied four of our interview requests. RT's um, coverage of MH17, immediately it started to give different theories while reporting the Western uh, certainty, seeming certainty here, that this was Vladimir Putin, who knows, with a rocket-propelled gun himself in his own hands, shooting down a plane and killing hundreds of people. Boris Yeltsin's former spin doctor, Alexander Nekrasov, reviews the media coverage with us too. He now works as a journalist and commentator for a range of different media outlets, including Russia Today. Before the plane even crashed on the ground, all the newspapers in the West accused Russia at once. Now, first of all, as a proper reporter, and I taught a lot of journalists, you know, journalism, you don't do things like that. The lack of credible facts hasn't prevented many in the West from jumping to conclusions. According to the Sun newspaper, the Russian president is personally responsible for downing the Malaysia Airlines plane in Ukraine. Russia today has a, uh, a role to play. Russia today has to uh, counter, uh, sort of uh, work as a counteract against some of the Western propaganda, because unfortunately it is propaganda that we're hearing. And by the way, now they found the pilot who shot down the plane, and they even know his name, Voloshin, and he even now confessed to what happened. This witness, this alleged witness, uh, he says that he worked at a Ukrainian uh, airfield from which military jets flew sorties uh, in the east of the country. The witness told us that the pilot, whose name is Captain Voloshin, was shocked, confused, and in the state of mind he defined the passenger jet as an operational target. One of the things that was suggesting strongly to us that there could potentially be some rebel involvement in the shooting down of MH17 was the fact that very quickly the Russian propaganda machine was in action suggesting lots of other, other alternatives. Uh, and It's almost like the more they s said it wasn't them, the, the more we thought it might be. Mark to Jersey was one of the first journalists to join Russia Today and was closely involved in developing the channel. It now has a potential audience of 700 million. With over a billion views, it is the world's largest news organization on YouTube. But RT started out much smaller, in 2005, with a modest allowance from the government. The music, that brings back the most memories. Da -da 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 -da. Um, I, I didn't do that very well, but, um, but that became the kind of, for six months, that's what I heard, you know, every 15 minutes of every hour of every eight hours we were on air. For years, Derek Sauer owned independent media. Russia's largest publishing house. He witnessed Russia Today's growth from close quarters. The Russian government set a new sender up, and what you then think is, all the men in the bad sit in the pack. That think you. And what the slimmer was, is geweest om precies het tegenovergestelde te doen. I think one of the key drivers behind Russia Today is Margarita Simonyan, who was a very young woman when she was appointed to head Rush Today. She is one of the smartest media executives we have in our generation. One of the main demands of professional news production is to be objective, is to keep the balance, which is, I think, absolutely obvious for everyone. One of her 
key insights, it was that every single one of the, ch the news channels internationally looked the same. And her instant observation was that Rush Today had to be different. So Rush Today, it was decided, had to be green because all other channels are blue or red. Rush Today had to have camera angles that moved in and out because other TV stations had camera angles that only panned from the side. And Rush Today had to have stories that there was a demand for that people were ignoring. Every time tests were run to see what people were liking or enjoying, if there was something popular, more space was given for it. Simon Yen came to visit me with a colleague who I, I think was uh, a Russian official, government official, to say that they wanted to launch Russia Today within six months. I expressed my scepticism to them, but I have to say they did it. And I think that's perhaps a, a mark of uh, the level of investment and of state backing that they had to cut through any bureaucracy or any hurdles that there were in order to get it launched on time. The Kremlin felt, from the perspective of Russia, that it was drowning in Western TV, Western ideas, Western agenda, Western NGOs, and that the Russian public had been watching or listening for 30 or 40 years, even during the period of the Berlin Wall, to Western media. And the Western media was able to define the story and set the narrative. The Kremlin feels that the Western media have had too much control over the international agenda, and they want to change that. RT comes out of the obsession with TV, and RT comes out of the desire to push uh, your dominance of TV into international water. British-Russian filmmaker and media expert Peter Pomerantsev grew up in England, but he has worked in the Russian TV industry for years. When it first launched, I was in Moscow, and very much their, their pitch to Western journalists who were there hiring was to kind of show that Russia was becoming democratic. I mean, Russia Today was going to be more democratic than Russian channels. A lot of Russian journalists I knew wanted to work for Russia Today because they thought it would be, give them more freedom than they would have at a Russian channel, a Russian language channel. And I think I might have said, well, listen, you know, Vladimir Putin doesn't have a good track record with journalism within his country. And they said, well, no, this is an effort, you know, to, to introduce some kind of, as, 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 as I was told emphatically. And that Marguerite is on record in, in, in press conferences. Um, and it was actually quite clever. She said, listen, we've hired guys from ABC News, Sky News, BBC News. You know, this will not be a propaganda channel. Censorship from the government in this country is prohibited by constitution. Like in yours. <laughs> the BBC wordt ook door the Britse overheid gefinancierd. Maar goed, there zijn allemaal protocollen en regels. En... En daar is een traditie. Het grote probleem in Rusland, uh, er is geen traditie. En daar is de traditie, uh, uh, wie, be wie betaalt, bepaalt. En als je dus weet dat, dat het Kremlin uh, de rekening betaalt, ja, dan weet je dat je daar uh, rekening mee moet houden. It was always going to be the case with Chechnya, with trying for separatism, etc., etc., um, and these kind of Eastern Bloc states, you know, possibly breaking off, um, it, it seemed editorially obvious that that was, was going to be the test for RT, getting fair and balanced coverage with those stories, with a, with a, a, with a kind of autocratic uh, president who, who likes to control the media. And that test came when war broke out in Georgia. For many years there had been tensions between the Georgian government and South Ossetia and Abkhazia two renegade republics with a high percentage of ethnic Russians. In August 2008, these tensions led to an armed confrontation. Shortly thereafter, Russia took military action. William Dunbar was Russia Today's correspondent in Georgia at the time. During a live broadcast, he mentioned unconfirmed reports of Russian fighter jets bombing apartment blocks in the Georgian town of Gori. And then I get a call from my producer, who goes, oh, did you say something about Gory being bombed? And I was like, oh, yeah, I said there were unconfirmed reports of, of Gory being bombed. She said, well, they're not very happy about that. I mean, what do you mean they're not very happy about that? And she goes, well, they, they, they don't want you to talk about that. I, you know, we have this discussion. I go into the office to see her, and I think, and I say, and by this time, by the time I've reached our office, we have the footage, like Reuters have the footage, APTV, APTN have the footage of, sure enough, Russian planes bombing Gori, hitting apartment blocks with, I think it caused 12 civilian casualties, maybe more. Um, 
and uh, and it's real. There's 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 the proof. There have been airstrikes by uh, Russian warplanes, particularly in a town just outside of Tbilisi, the capital, a town called Gori. But this is Gori today, a ghost town where Stalin's statue ironically towers over the main square. Yes, there is glass on the ground and damaged cars. But look at these pictures and judge for yourself. That night, Russia Today's editors called on William Dunbar again. He was asked to debunk a faulty CNN report. The American news channel had wrongly announced that the Georgian capital of Tbilisi had been bombed. And they go, well, we want you to, to say that Tbilisi is not being bombed. It's not being bombed, is it? I go, well, no, it isn't being bombed. And they go, well, that's great. That's what we want. Um, and I go, well, OK, but I want you to know that at that time, we just had news that two other civilian towns, other than Gori, were bombed also with multiple civilian casualties in both Poti and uh, in Zugdidi in the west of Georgia. Um, and uh, I go, well, I want you to, I'm going to mention, I want you to know that I'm going to mention, if I debunk this CNN account, I'm also going to mention that there are confirmed reports of Poti and Zugdidi being bombed with civilian casualties. And they said, well, in that case, we don't want the phone. And I said, in that case, I'm afraid I no longer work for you. And, uh, and that was that. So the big sort of transformation seems to happen during the War with Georgia. Before that, Russia State had been quite sort of, you know, quite boring and, and conservative and not particularly scandalous. And suddenly the War with Georgia, they seem to finally understand why they were created for. And I think that's the first time people s sat up and noticed them. Because, you know, during the war in Georgia, they'd have like a, a running line saying, genocide by the Georgians. Genocide in huge letters because, you know, some separatist official claimed that there was a genocide. Lavrov said that there's, you know, 1,500 dead civilians killed by Georgian troops. Of course, none of this turned out to be true. It, all, it turned out that there was only a few hundred civilians, uh, most of whom were, were Georgian civilians who were killed during the war, rather than these thousands. There was certainly no genocide. He defended uh, the description of what's happening in the region as genocide. He said that out of 100,000 people, 2,000 killed, 30,000 refugees. He said, that's enough. What do you make of that? Well, I, I think he, he made a very... Uh, this is exactly point. why I had to resign. Can you imagine? I mean, if I'd have stayed, they would have been asking me to use the word genocide, I guess? Or to report on the potential genocide? Or... I don't know. D did they need to check it? I suppose they did. But again, this is a war situation. So you want, in this war conflict situation, out of the blue, people to think very carefully and... I mean, of that particular situation. And I don't know. I don't know. I, to be, I'll be honest with you. I don't know what to answer on that particular subject. I'm not aware of that particular broadcast, I have to say, because RT was just beginning around that time, as far as I understand. I really think that's when the cards were placed on the table, that Rush Today is not really about news. It's about presenting how the Kremlin wants you to view this news event. Shortly after William Dunbar resigned in 2008, Sarah Firth started her career with Russia Today. I knew a little bit about the controversy already around RT, that there was one story that had always uh, already been run from someone who'd resigned uh, talking about their time in Georgia. So it was out there, there, there was already information um, but honestly, I was so excited to get back to Russia uh, that it didn't, it didn't even really factor in into my decision-making process. There was no doubt I was going to take the job. The directors of Russia Today look at the Western media and they see disarray, they see collapsing news agencies, they see no pay, they see no stable jobs, they see a generation of young journalists in Britain and America who are embittered at not having any stable jobs and they can prey on them very easily. I got the email one day, I opened up my computer, there was an email with a contract from RT um, and I thought I'd won the lottery. When I did the currency conversion on what they were offering, I was sort of, it was mind-blowing. In 2010, Russia Today decided to expand. After creating both an Arabic and a Spanish channel, they turned their attention to the American market. The channel presents itself as an alternative to Western mainstream news. It's the reason why we, here at RTTV America, are taking on that responsibility of covering stories not told by the mainstream media. 
Ready? Go! Liz Wool started working at RT America's bureau in Washington, D.C. in 2011. She quickly became one of the channel's anchors. It's Thursday, May 24th, 8 p.m. here in Washington, D.C. I'm Liz Wall, and you're watching RT. By then, Russia Today was the second most-watched foreign news channel in America, surpassed only by BBC World. I asked them about journalistic independence, and they assured me that, that this was not a propaganda station, that, yeah, we, are, we do try to do different stories, but we try to, what they really hammered home, that this is an opportunity to cover stories that the mainstream media ignores. RT is uh, running a counter-narrative, and its tagline is, question more. So, uh, luckily, in a time when corporate and state-mandated media is uh, so uniform, it's actually quite easy. This is the pitch they're taking. I, again, I think they see that this trend exists in the West. They see that there's a sort of already uh, an utterly homegrown campaign against the mainstream, um, a philosophical one, this idea of the other, uh, the idea of alternative always being good. Uh, and they're just trying to tap into that. You'd meet colleagues who were hypercritical of RT. Um, I used to find it a bit strange that you'd think, do you think I wake up in the morning and think, oh, I'm going to go out and be a propagandist today? How can I manipulate the news? No, of course you're not doing that. Um, I fully believed in reporting alternative stories. The clashes between the police and the protesters is still going on. You can just touch here. You've got the police. Greece. It was the first big story that I had, um, and... We got caught in the middle of, of one of the riots. And RT just put all the footage up. So I actually had a colleague at RT phone me and he was saying, Sarah, you might want to have a look at what they've put online. And they were so happy because this clip had gone viral and it was getting loads of hits online. Um, so I felt great. I was, you know, it, I'd done well and the channel were thrilled with it. <laughs> thank you, thank you. They gave these young journalists like myself a camera crew and a travel budget that was insane. Go and do the story however you best feel you should do it. There were no rules. And it was just with a couple of conversations I had with other journalists about that, where they said, you know, just be careful, because if you'd done that at our channel, um, it, it wouldn't perhaps be looked on in the same way. That was the first time I think I became aware of the fact it's on me, it's my choice how safe I am on the story, because there's not that infrastructure at RT. And actually moving forward, that was often the stuff that was encouraged. They, they, wanted you to be in the center of the action. The uh, hosts, die vaak uh, buitenland zijn, Engels, uh, Amerikaans enzovoort, die, die worden natuurlijk vooral, dat zijn allemaal jonge mensen natuurlijk, allemaal eager, goed betaald, maar, maar heel ambitieus. Um, en, uh, um, en die zijn, dat zijn geen journalistieke zwaargewichten. De, de, de journalistieke beslissingen worden allemaal genomen door Russen. The majority of the employees at RT America, at least here in the DC Bureau, are, are Americans, but it's ran by Russians. We used to joke in the newsroom that you kind of felt like RT was hate preaching because you'd have a, an hour's rundown where it would be, you know, we hate Europe, we hate Georgia, we hate America, and then a story right at the end would be like, and look at this wonderful Russian event. Even if it's an important story, if it didn't make the US or the, or, or, a Western country look bad enough, if I didn't hammer home a certain angle enough, well then, the news story wasn't really serving its purpose. This was the daily battle at RT. Um, you would be fighting over a sentence, and that would be the difference between you finishing work, you know, after six hours or finishing work after 18, you know? It was really that ridiculous. You just don't criticize Russia. You don't, you just don't go there. There's an un, almost like an unspoken rule. You just know you're not supposed to suggest that story. 
I don't recognize any of that in terms of banter in the newsroom. All the banter in the newsroom I remember, and still we have that banter, is get the story that's too mainstream, find an angle which helps those not in power. Uh, the, the, the phrases I hear in the RTUK newsroom are, think about truth telling to the, to the powerful or the truth of what's happening to the powerless, not let's do the Kremlin's bidding on foreign policy. And it's a great shame that uh, these claims are used to stereotype our newsroom. The way that they encourage us to write some of our scripts is that Oh, look at the other news stations they're covering. That they're, they're, they're not even paying attention to this. They're not even covering this. Um, almost as if it's some sort of conspiracy that the, ma the, the mainstream media, the corporate media, they are part of the military-industrial complex. They work hand-in-hand -hand with the U.S. government. In Russian information psychological war theory, everything at all times is an information psychological war. It's, like a per, it's, it's more like a slightly Trotskyist vision of the world, where, where the world is involved in information war all the time. So CNN, BBC are naturally tools of the CIA that are being used to attack Russia. Uh, we have to attack back. And the main way we attack is by disorganizing the enemy. The media coverage in the West has been largely slanted against Russia. You know, the corporate media distracts us from what you and I should care about because they're a profit-driven industry that sells us sensationalistic garbage and calls it breaking news. The Western media present their damning cries as the voice of the whole world's outrage. Investigative journalist Adrian Salbucci says the press is trying to protect the interests of Europe and the US. I think the aim is to show that everyone is biased, everyone is faulty, everyone is lying, everyone is propaganda, and thus, you know, spreading this lack of belief in everything. Um, once you have that kind of wasteland, then, you know, you can spin anything you want into it. Russia Today again presented its own interpretation of events at the end of 2013, when protests broke out on Maidan Square in Kiev and tensions escalated in Crimea. This is the Crimea. There are two roads connecting the peninsula to the mainland, here and here. This is one of them two roads that locals say could become two gateways for undesirable forces from the north. They fear that Ukrainian fascists pose a major threat. The country's ultranationalist right sector group helped topple President Yanukovych. Now many Crimeans are worried that such radicals want to come and open Pandora's box. Ukraine, it was the first time that, mess that the questions were very much, that were fed to me. Um, verbatim, word for word, like we want you to touch upon this. We want you to ask about the neo-Nazis in, in the opposition. Um, we want you to point out the hypocrisy of the West and the U.S. Um, in invading other countries in the past. Um, we don't want you to use the word in, you, in invasion because we don't want this to look like an invasion. The Ukrainian stories that we were running about fascist elements uh, amongst the protesters, there was no context in that. At no point did RT say, but actually this is the figure, that this is the sort of percentage of people that we have this problem with, and here's the bigger story behind it. So you hone in on this tiny bit, and the story becomes something completely different. The threat of neo-Nazi ideology is causing alarm in Ukraine. That's stoking fears of a rise in neo-Nazism. Labour has always supported selling killing machines to dictators, but its present leader appeared to argue for exports to the neo-Nazis of Kiev. RT, I mean, one would have to ask my editor why we couldn't afford a full-scale uh, polling organisation commission for Maidan Square to work out uh, how many uh, Nazis or people with Nazi sympathies uh, were involved in the coup d'etat. Calling the enemy fascists and Nazis and Banderovtsi, which was the word of the kind of gangs and partisans that were sometimes fighting with Hitler and sometimes fighting against him from the Ukrainian side, is to make people emotional. Are they sort of picking up the phone and telling the head of the channel, uh, of um, first national channel or second national channel or RT, I want you to write this down? No, they don't do it. No, they don't. It is interesting because I met some old colleagues at the BBC recently and they actually believed that I was phoned by the Kremlin before we do our show Going Underground. And I presumed they were joking and then I realized, no, they actually believe that the Kremlin phones me up when we make the show. 
I mean, this is just patent nonsense. When you work in an authoritarian state and in the media propaganda channels in an authoritarian state, there isn't a sort of email coming in every morning going, we say this, we don't say this. People are paid high salaries. and because It's mostly self-censorship. You're kind of guessing what they don't want you to say. There was self-censorship there. You were expected to self-censor. And it was, they, were, they didn't tell you explicitly, you must self-censor, but you learned that that's something that you have to do in order to get by there, to not, to not clash with the news director, to not clash with management. You can't progress unless you guess right. You can't get a promotion unless you guess right. You can't advance much further. So that's how it works, more or less. So most Western journalists working there put themselves in this mindset where they are thinking towards Putin. RT, at the end of the day, only has one viewer, Putin. They have to convince Putin that the model they've chosen is the right model. In April 2014, when it was unclear where the Russian soldiers were operating in then Ukrainian-controlled Crimea, the underlying ties between the Russian media and the Kremlin became clearly visible. When I traveled to Crimea, I expected to find what I saw on TV back home. Images of the mighty Russian military storming into Ukraine. I confess I did see one Russian tank with my own eyes. But this battle machine has been here since the 1940s and not going anywhere ever since. Come on, really? I mean, there was, yeah, I mean, there's probably an element of truth there that there was an old rusty tank, but there's other ones elsewhere. <laughs> I mean, that's not the whole story. Several weeks after the annexation of Crimea, then President Putin did uh, say in a speech in the Kremlin that yes, indeed, there had been Russian troops in Crimea and uh, they'd done a very good job. So all the, the Kremlin's position and the position of all the Russian media until that point was completely undermined by the fact that he then admitted what had happened. We had to take measures to prevent the situation from developing the way it is now in eastern Ukraine, with tanks and well-armed radical nationalists. Of course, behind the self-defense units of Crimeans, we had our servicemen. A lot of questions came in regarding the situation in Crimea, the referendum, and sensationally Vladimir Putin admitted that those were indeed Russian troops on the ground in Crimea, but this was the only way for the referendum to be held and to avoid any sort of bloodshed. RT is the one we see because it's the one in English language. But the main Russian state channels in Russian uh, take this massive step further. And uh, they can one day say black is white, and the next day say actually maybe it's grey, and then they'll uh, another day say that it's black. When it comes to the whole Ukraine crisis, which I found so uh, remarkable in mainstream media with a number of Russian soldiers in Crimea, as if this was a big surprise, um, you know, this is, this is plainly absurd. Why will the mainstream media not realize the true story behind what was happening in Ukraine? I know, because de facto, the mainstream is taking their orders from NATO powers and tropes of neoliberal, neocon behavior. You basically see the American domination. America, American media dictates the terms to the Western media. And that's how it is, and that's how it has been for quite some time now, ever since the Cold War. The Kremlin thinks in terms of narratives. Putin, his key advisers, and, of course, Margarita Simonyan, the head of Russia today, don't really believe in the truth. They don't believe there is such a thing as objective truth. But what happens when that becomes an excuse to you know, inject disinformation, when, you know, having lots of truths means you can just start making things up, when relativity gets to the point where any truth uh, is, as, is as important as another one. And to give an example, RT will put a neo-Nazi on and say, he's, he's got his own truth. They'll put a madman on and say, he's got his own truth. What's the difference between a conspiracy and a, a fact-based argument? But Russia Day is, in a sense, the purest, crudest TV news, news channel in the world. Complete rejection of Truth, complete focus on viewing figures. They had one show where they had interviews with Jewish leaders uh, in Ukraine. Uh, one of them was the rabbi in Simferopol. A more Nazi graffiti appears on the walls in Ukrainian cities and ultra-nationalists are given key government posts. Kiev's Jewish community feels they can no longer entrust their safety to the police. I don't want to live. 
I'm pushed to leave. Because I want uh, my children to feel safe. According to Russia Today, the rabbi left Crimea because of anti-Semitic graffiti on the walls of his synagogue and fear of Ukrainian nationalists. On the phone, Rabbi Kapustin tells us quite a different version of events. They just made it look like that I was escaping from the Ukrainian nationalists. They made it look like, in fact, uh, rather for escaping from uh, the Russian forces. That is just, I mean, that's just this crass, you know, beyond any kind of journalistic kind of boundary of, of behavior. Let's go back to our breaking news story now because a Malaysian Boeing airplane has reportedly crashed in Ukraine's east where the military is battling against local self-defense units. I was down just outside the office having a coffee with another colleague from RT and we got the flash on the phone alert. Uh, so we ran back up to the office to see obviously what was going on. And we got RT, it was running on the TV, but we were in one of the edit booths. We put it up on the laptop and we were all crowded round and were just horrified by the way that RT were covering it. MH17 was just the, the final point and I snapped. And then I, I put out on my Twitter account that I, that I resigned. The more that I read up on what was really going on, the more I realized that the media was actually being used as a tool to stir confusion about what's going on there. I felt really uncomfortable with that. And I decided that the time had come that I was going to leave. Uh, after our coverage of the Ukraine wrapped up, I, I uh, went off the teleprompter and I kind of spoke from the heart, had a couple of, of thoughts scribbled down and, and that was it. And that is why personally I cannot be part of a network funded by the Russian government that whitewashes the actions of Putin. I'm proud to be an American and believe in disseminating the truth. And that is why, after this newscast, I'm resigning. I felt shaky. I felt nervous. I felt um, almost shocked that I did it, but I felt kind of good. I was RT. I was part of that family. And I, you know, I was taking the money. I did have to take the rough with the smooth. It just, you know, when the rough comes, it's really rough. And there are a lot of questions that you can't answer for yourself. There is a fear, is there a fear maybe, that uh, we must be covering this story because we're somehow either doing it for the money or we are, uh, you know, Russian secret service agents. It, one cannot over-exaggerate the uh, levels of vitriol against uh, RT journalists. I don't know Sarah Furt's particular circumstances, whether she was frightened off by it, but uh, I firmly believe she was uh, utterly wrong when it came to her analysis of the kind of work she's been doing uh, and being paid for by RT to do. This is quoting a, uh, a Russian media guru, Vasily Gato. He said, that if in the 20th century, the great problem was the, um, uh, in the 20th century, the great problem was the battle against censorship, the battle for freedom of information. In the 21st century, the great problem is going to be the abuse of freedom of information. One of the risks we have in the modern media age is that audiences are no longer able to discern the quality and the basis of the information the media offers them because there's so much of it out there and those, those traditional standards are being eroded by the fashion of saying there's no such thing as objectivity, there's no such thing as the truth, there's no such thing as a fact. Wrong. There is and they matter. The danger is that what Russia is doing is really going to be the global trend in the 21st century. As there are more channels, as the amount of realities sort of proliferates and proliferates, do we just get to a point where we can't have any kind of reality-based conversation anymore? And then things start to really come apart. Then you have this very anarchic future where everyone has their own version of the truth. Um, all that matters is how you manipulate emotions. This is what you know, RT management and Russian sort of TV bosses say a lot. We don't need truth, it's just about emotions. Um, and, and then, you know, th then everything sort of starts to come apart. And, and then uh, the most sort of uh, rapacious and the most cynical is going to win in that, kind of, in that kind of context. Thank you for watching. For more on this subject, take a look at the playlist. You can also watch this recommended video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and we'll keep you updated on our documentaries.